Ja, och ha igen till vetenskap och demokrati. Um, detta föreläsning ska handla om vetenskap och pseudovetenskap och det ska jag hålla det på engelsk kan se si någon ord någon gång uh, om vad det kanske betyder på norsk. Ehm um, och självklart vill vår um, Zoom möte också vara på norsk, men sedan där har önskat att vi gör det på engelsk, då gör vi det på engelsk. Okej, okay, då switchar jag till engelsk. So this lecture is about science and pseudoscience and it will come in in three parts. Um the texts were this uh, text, Science and Pseudoscience by Imre Lakatos, a, uh, an important influential philosopher of science who lived in the mid part of the 20th century, and Philip Kitcher, who is an important philosopher of science still alive today. And in fact, he will talk about um, issues in this rough area and also related issues next year in Oslo, where we've invited him to give an annual lecture at the Center for Philosophy and the Sciences. Okay, but with that further ado, let's go to the question of science and pseudoscience. <clears throat> when we use the word science to describe something, um, that can often mean a kind of praise, a positive evaluation. Um, so I invite you to yourself think about examples where that is happening. Um, but those of you who come from the sciences certainly will have heard, for example, that um, people will say that something is not scientific. Um, that's not scientific as a criticism of, for example, um, opinions formed by, uh, say, a specific politician. That their opinions are not based on science or that you might criticize your, what your family members say about climate change by saying that's not based on science science says this and, and, and so on so in these cases for example the word science is used to give something a kind of positive evaluation and legitimacy um, you see that in a number of areas. Um, so in the university, if something is recognized as science, then it gets um, a department, um, the different sciences have departments. Um, and um, it goes from the natural sciences to the social sciences. Uh, and we might also want to include here the human sciences. Um, so sociology, economics, um, archaeology, physics, mathematics, and so on. So to recognize that science has, uh, gives, uh, it gives that uh, a department in the university, the research council might give money for it, there are jobs in it, the government might ask you for advice on policy making. So it's here you see Fauci, the, the American um, um, research um, uh, leader for the um, coronavirus um, policies. So he gives advice on the um, on what the science says about about this, for example. Uh, and similarly, um, we have um, scientific advisory boards in the Norwegian context. Um, and also to be called science is also leads to uh, it being taught at school, for example. This is something that Kitcher talks a little bit about. Um, when you, um, um, when it's, uh, children learn about um, scientific subject like biology, they do not learn normally about what, for example, some particular religion says about the origin of the universe. So someone, if a field is called science, then it has an influence on many generations by, for example, being taught in school. Um, so this leads to two uh, effects. On the one hand, um, it is often, it can be, um, because it, it, it gives a certain area a sort of uh, legitimacy, it can sometimes be um, 
beneficial to a certain group to disguise something that isn't science as science. They might not do this intentionally, but they recognize that uh, that being called science gives you a kind of legitimacy. So, for example, creationists uh, in the United States try to get creationist science into schools. Um, um, so, but then the question is, when is that? Uh, there's then a the question: When is that happening? Or when isn't really science? And so, for example, some people uh, suggest, and like Lakatos, that Marxist. Uh, science isn't really science, um, uh, but they're trying to get legitimacy by being taught in schools. And then some other people might say that isn't really science. Um, so the other side of this is that for the same reason, a discrediting something as pseudoscience is, um, is a way to take out something that may have legitimacy of the university context, the school context, the advisory board context. Here's an example that has gotten a lot of um, attention in the history. Um, Lysenko or, was used by the Soviet um, government in the early 20th century to discredit lots of parts of science, like, for example, genetics as pseudoscience and therefore delegitimizing it. Okay. So this leads then to this big question, what exactly is the difference between science and pseudoscience? And it's going to be important in a number of different areas. Um, on the one hand, it's important to uh, distinguish what is in fact not science from what is legitimate science, but it's also important to answer those who claim that a particular area of inquiry isn't really science. Um, and this can happen uh, in, in many like critical race science, for example, some people called only pseudoscience. So how does one respond to such a claim? Gender science, the same, same has been called only a pseudoscience. So how does one respond to that? So that's then what makes this question, what actually is the difference between science and pseudoscience really important? Okay, <clears throat> now let's think about some ideas for that. Um, and we'll discuss first some ideas that Kitcher and Lakatos reject. Um, and then um, we'll see whether they, they have good reasons to reject. Um, a, a, first, a first idea that you might have is that science uses experiments. Um, and I think many people who work in um, in an in, a, in an experimental science, they this seems very natural. That is un, unlike um, people who just cook up ideas by sitting at home on their couch. It, real science uses experimental evidence um, to uh, support their uh, results. Um, so. Since so just well, that is a, an indication of science that uses experiments. Now, on second thought, though, um, this doesn't seem quite right. Um, on the one hand, it doesn't seem like um, experiments are necessary for something to be a science. There are many uh, sciences, it seems, uh, that don't use any experiments. Um, so mathematics doesn't use experiments or hardly ever uses experiments. Theoretical physics doesn't. Many parts of economics doesn't use experiments. Political science hardly ever uses any experiments. So it doesn't seem that it's a necessary feature of science that use experiments. There are also sciences that don't use experiments. And the other hand, as Lakatos points out, doesn't seem sufficient for science either. Um, he points out that the medieval alchemists, which you see here a picture, they used something like experiments too. They did a lot of experimentations with complicated apparatus and so on to do experiments. So simply to, to do something like experimentation is not something that's sufficient for science. Okay, I want to make a meta comment at this point about these two words because they're important to know about. Something being necessary and sufficient. 
Okay. These are um, um, important words to, to know about. So the one is something is necessary for something that it must be present for the other thing to be present. So if experiments would be necessary for science, then they must be present. And we see they must not be present because there's some examples where they're not present. Sufficient means then if something is a sufficient condition for something, then that thing, um, when that thing is present, then the other thing is also present. So here, when you have experimentation, then you also have science. And we see that's not the case because there can be experiments without science. So these are two important concepts to know about necessary and sufficient conditions. We see them here at uh, play. Okay, so now we get to uh, another idea. Um, maybe uh, science isn't all about experimentation, as we see in mathematics, as we see in theoretical physics. But what we see in those areas where we don't see experiments is proof, scientific proof. Um, science is proven right, um, while the other things are just faith or luck or guess. And science will have proof. Ponoshka Bevis. Now, I think that can sound plausible that we don't know anything unless we have proof of it. Take the following example. Suppose that you have 100,000 tickets in a lottery, but only 10 of those tickets win. Okay, 10 of 100,000. If you, do you know that you, if you buy a ticket, you will not win? Most people answer, uh, it, it's certainly the case that it's 99.99% certain, not certain, that you don't win. It's very, very sure. Nevertheless, most people think you don't actually know that you won't win. So most think that they don't know that you won't win. So a possible idea then is that it's not enough to be very certain. It requires proof and certainty that to know anything, then you might think that then certainly if one knows only something, if one's certain requires it in science too. Uh, and that idea that we often don't have certainty, then is often used by people who criticize um, certain areas of science um, to say, well, these are not really, we don't have proof in these areas. So um, it's, we only have, um, we only, it's only a theory, okay? Um, so you find this discussed quite a bit in the um, article by Philip Kitcher. Um, so <clears throat> climate change skeptics, creationists often argue that, or suggest say that evolution or climate change is just a theory, it's not proven. We don't know that it's true, okay? And indeed, that's a large percentage of the population thinks that then, for example, we don't know that, um, for example, um, evolution um, has, um, is the, the, the source of, of uh, is what brought humans into being. So here's data from the United States that in 2019, we, we see that 40% of people in America believe that God created man in, in his present form. So the skepticism toward evolution is indeed large, widespread. And since, um, I mean, maybe many of some of you respond well, but not in Norway, um, at least when it comes to climate change, that is not quite true. Um, there are also <clears throat> a quite large number of people um, that believe that climate change is not man-made. Uh, so these will be at least, at least partly uh, disagree, uh, part, the, the number of people who at least partly disagree with the idea that climate change is man-made, this 18% of, of, of the Norwegian population. So that's uh, quite, um, quite, quite a lot. Um, now, probably not many among you because you are younger and there's data suggest that young people are not so skeptical. In any case, often people like this suggest it's just a theory, it's not known. 
because we're not certain. So this leads us to Science must be proven right, we must be certain. Okay. The problem with this idea though, is that when you apply this, this idea that science must be proven right, that leads really that we must be certain to know anything, that that leads to a form of really a radical skepticism. If, and what, and what do we mean by that? By that, we mean that it leads to the idea that we, in fact, know next to nothing. For example, you if you need certainty, you also won't know that you're sitting in front of a computer right now or in front of your phone looking here into the lecture. Maybe you're dreaming. Are you certain? It's a small percent chance that maybe this is just a dream. Or maybe there's a small percent of chance that you have half an hour ago taken a drug that you now have some crazy hallucinations that you've forgotten that you've taken the drug and that this isn't real. So maybe you're not sitting in front of a computer. Maybe this is just a wild hallucination, some weird trip on uh, this new drug that you've tried. That's possible. So you're not certain that that's not true. So then if you apply the idea that in order to know something, you need certainty, we're not certain of the idea, also not of the, the fact that you are in, in front of a computer right now. And so it, so, so we, um, we get this radical skepticism. We know nothing if you apply that idea across the board. So what then should we do with someone who is a skeptic? Um, um, that is who says, well, we don't know that climate change exists. We don't know that men are the pro people are the product of evolution. So I think there's two things one can um, uh, say that to them and I suggest to you that you think about other ones too. So one is, then says, look, <laughs> uh, people who think that we are not, we don't know that climate change is real, we did answer them that if you think that we don't know that climate change is real, then if you use the same standards for knowing, you also probably don't know that you're sitting in front of a computer or that your kitchen isn't currently in flames. So you should run to your kitchen and check whether it's not in flames because you don't know that it's not in flames. And if it is in flames, then you so should run. So the, the point here is that <clears throat> people who are skeptics toward climate change or evolution, they, they usually apply that kind of thinking that one needs certainty only in a particular area. And that is the area that serves some other purposes. Um, for example, that um, you know they um, their investment in the oil in in the oil industry um, is uh, is is this something for that's very useful not to believe in climate change. <clears throat> and the other thing to to say to that skeptic is that the skepticism argument is self undermining. So what does that mean? Um, are you certain that science requires certainty? If you're not certain, then you don't know that it requires certainty. And then by your own standards, you haven't given me any reasons to believe that um, knowledge requires certainty. Um, so maybe I'm, I am more sure that um, I know that I'm from sitting in front of a computer that science, climate change is real, then I know that you know, this theory about knowledge or about science is true. So um, I will believe in that. Okay, these are two ways of answering the skeptic. Um, I invite you to think about other others. <clears throat> now, Kitcher mentions some more reasons to think that science cannot require proof. Um, and it's certainly in what he points out that it's just not an adequate description of how science actually works. Um, Well-established theories in the history of science um, were certainly shown to be wrong. So here you have Newton's theory that the planets move in ellipses around the sun. That's a theory. Uh, it was one of the most well-established theories ever, but it's not quite accurate. Um, Einstein's um, theory of gravitation supplanted it. Also scientists, like other people, have limits, um, they, they're, they, they're certain things are too small for them to see, they make mistakes. And so if science would require proof, then 
um, we would hardly ever have in the scientific results. Um, and as we uh, mentioned, um, as I mentioned earlier, it seems like nothing really can be proven with certainty. And so there wouldn't be any science. And so that would be sort of very unuseful to distinguish science from pseudoscience by appealing to this idea of certainty. But there's a, you know, maybe you know for certainty that you exist. So if you take the philosophy, you can think about maybe there's some one thing that you know with certainty that is that you exist. Read Descartes if you're interested in that. Um, <clears throat> Now that leads one to uh, another idea. Um, maybe um, science requires not certainty, but it requires that the theories are supported by what are the known or observed facts. So a scientific theory then would be a theory that is supported by the observed facts. Um, that seems to get some of the problem, rid of some of the problems with the experiments idea. So with the idea of experiments was that maybe some scientists don't, um, some scientists don't exclude experiments, but they often still do observations. They rely on facts to show a theory that we find also in physics and in theoretical physics, we find it in um, mathematics and political science and, and so on. So um, that seems to still exist also in these areas. Um, but then there are the following two problems with this idea. Um, the question is here, what exactly does it mean to be that, that some facts support a theory? Uh, one suggestion is that the facts must entail the theory. That is, given the facts, the theory must be true. The problem is though, that if you just take some facts, then you're, not, never, going to, you're never going to entail a particular theory in this sense. So I'm going to make this point by showing, wait, so as I make in two ways. First, I'm going to make it this. So take the observed facts about the movement of the planets. Those facts do not entail Newton's theory that there's elliptical, that the movements are elliptical. Um, and that was true even before Einstein, it didn't entail that because um, the, the movements are not in fact elliptical. They are slightly different because that's only true when you take away the uh, forces coming from the gravitational field of all the other um, planets and all the stars and all the comets and so on. They would just slightly distort these ellipses. So, so, the, so th these facts of observation will not entail um, Newton's theory exactly. You need to abstract away from a lot of details. And so um, it doesn't actually, the, the, the theory is never directly entailed by these by the facts. Um, another, the way I'd, I'd love to make this, this point is that it, it, by looking at how to fit a graph through some points. So suppose you have made some observations and then you have the data and you plot them. Um, there's many different ways you can have a theory about what these data mean that are compatible with those observations. Um, so there's many different curves that can be fitted through uh, a number of observations. How you do that is not a matter of just the data, it's a matter of the data plus some independent reasons to think that a certain type of theory must be right. So many curves of the theories are compatible with the data. You need something else than data to come up with a theory. So that means science, it can't just mean that what is that the theory must be something that's entailed by the data. That is not true for um, any um, number of, in a finite number of data. And another question here, of course, is exactly what an observation is and exactly what facts are that are supposed to support the um, the theory? Now let's so let's look at again at the uh, issue that we talked about last week, Clifford's evidentialism. So the general problem there's a general problem here. Um, so Clifford, remember, had the idea that you should believe something only if you have good evidence for it. But now we've seen there's a problem here. The in in if a, if, if a pseudoscience hides a science, it tends to appeal to something that at least resembles evidence too, or something that it, that is the pseudoscience, treats as facts or observations. 
And if science is discredited as pseudoscience, as Lysenko did uh, in the Stalinist uh, um, uh, Soviet Union, it's often claimed that what it says is evidence isn't really evidence. So the problem is that if you um, want to support theory by evidence, there's a certain kind of holism there. You already need to make some assumptions in order to support any theory by the evidence. And those things will depend on other things and so on. So in some sense, every theory in some sense fits the evidence of facts, but it's all it's it's not so simple as you can read off the data some kind of theory. <clears throat> so the the so so this then suggests something else. Um, if you look at these curves um, here. Um, not all of them are equally likely. Um, they're, all of them are possible ways of explaining the data, but they're not equally likely. So it leads to this idea that maybe what science does is that it makes certain theories more probable in the scientific views about the world as those that are more likely than um, the non-scientific theories. So evidence supports some theories to some degree, but there's some chance that it's wrong. Um, We'll see in the next part of the lecture that Karl Popper, the philosopher, thinks that cannot be right. There is, he actually thinks this radical idea that there is no, there, no evidence supports any theory in any way. We cannot use supporting evidence at all. Um, we cannot uh, ever get any, make any theory more probable. I actually think that he's wrong about this and probabilism is pretty it's, it's a pretty it's a pretty good theory that scientific views about the world are those that are more likely true than um than uh, the non-scientific ones but we'll get to that in the next part of the lecture thank you for now <laughs>